Thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif, an urban planner, and you're more than welcome to join my big journey of exploring the making of smarter and more livable cities. Please don't forget to follow Urbanistica on the different social media platforms. And also let's connect on LinkedIn. Big thanks to Urbanistica podcast partner, Afri. Afri is an international engineering and design company providing sustainable solutions in the fields of energy, industry, and infrastructure. Are you ready for a new episode? Let's go for it. Hello and uh, welcome back, Professor Tignan, to Urbanistica podcast. Thank you very much, Mustafa. It's always good to come back to this very relaxing, enjoyable and intellectual environment. Thank you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm okay. I think I'm... Uh, yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now we have a new book. That's Congratulations. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, sort of a post-COVID-19 book. Yeah, yeah. I took a little bit longer than we thought, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, it finally came out and... Uh, I think we're all happy about it. Yeah. Although yeah. there's always things you could rectify in the when it's printed always. and so on. Also working with specific publishers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but tell me about the background of, of making this book. Like how did right. you get the idea and so on? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think Women Reclaiming the City book was uh, born maybe some 15 years ago in my head or maybe a little bit less. Okay. Uh, it was... Uh, for for various reasons, some of the simplest triggers were, I think one of the talks given one one of our colleagues, uh, my colleague Katja Grinler, professor uh, at the School of Architecture, where she, where she was showing in, in one of the talks two slides, and on one slide were all these famous male architects. Okay, and she asked the more or less the audience to recognize them, and of course they were all recognizable. Mm-hmm. It was not difficult, maybe out of 20 you recognize 19. And then the next slide was all female architects throughout history. Oh. And you could barely recognize any of them, at least the mm. audience could say maybe two or three names. Okay. And just this mm. was one, one a little bit wake up call to see that, you know, not just the cities we're living in and they're designed and planned by men, that we live in a sort of yeah. very strong patriarchal society. and that we have this sort of also, I would say, injustice when it comes to recognizing great architects, mm. planners that are female. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was that um, I think I had made a conference, which was rather, I would say, famous in 2004, mm. uh, New Urbanism Beyond, <clears throat> uh, sort of uh, highlighting the new urban planning and design movement that came from the US, mm. based v- very much on new traditional principles and transport-oriented development. And I think I brought I, w- I don't like to use the word elite, but really the, the academic and practitioner elite uh, that represented the movement. Mm. And there were also, you know, men and female invited. But the end, at the end, out of the 25 keynote speakers, 24 were men. Uh, wow. So, uh, and of course, I was the organizer. And I think this was good for me. Uh, mm. You learn by your, uh, your mistakes. And after that, I've never done that again. And I've always yeah. been sort of I've had a balanced mm. uh, uh, group of people in there. So these were maybe the two little triggers, but I think the idea was, um, in a sense, really original, um, and I can't really pinpoint when. Yeah. I wanted to, to have a book by extraordinary urban studies female scholars. Okay. And mm. as a caveat, the book was, I already decided it's going to be more or less a Western perspective. Mm. So nothing, sort yeah. of not excluding the global South, let's mm. say the pers- the African, South American perspective or Asian one, but this was just a conscious decision. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, as you've seen from the, as we'll see from the interview uh, or our <clears throat> discussion panel with some of our guests mm. or colleagues from the book, mm. there's an extraordinary body of knowledge yes. that these female scholars have produced yeah. and that generations of scholars in the global north and global mm. south are really uh, yeah. working on and also implementing in their mm. practical mm. work. So what is the mission of this book? I think the mission is that to break the bonds of this, uh, on one side, I'll probably say structural injustice when it comes to equality of sexes in academia. Mm. Uh, I think we have had advances, in, especially in getting faculty 
uh, getting a number of professors that are female, get a number of urban scholars that are female. We ha- we're do- going, doing, going towards that quite well. Yeah. But when it comes to the body of literature, mm. the books we read, the text, the projects we look at, I still think there's a discrepancy in that, it's especially the way that female scholars and practitioners look at the city is very much different than we men have that perspective. Mm, mm. There's, a, I would say, a softer, more nuanced perspective on housing issues, of r- issues of racial inequality, mm. of justice, of transportation, especially uh, of security and mm, safety mm, in mm. public spaces. Yeah. And, and um, how was the selection of, of the contributors? Like, what, what is the process or, or based on what? Right. <clears throat> the book was uh, basically conceived in the Center for the Future Places mm. through the Athena uh, Distinguished mm. Scholar Series. And we've had an extraordinary academic board in the center, which which was very much balanced between men and women of uh, different, uh, uh, I would say, disciplinary perspective. Mm. We had uh, cultural anthropologists, urban sociologists, planners, yeah. urban economists, mm. architects. And uh, together with them and also with mm. our strategic board, We've decided for a number of names, and then I also expanded. I've been in urbanism for almost 25 years, so I have a very, rather good outlook on the literature mm-hmm. and on the uh, uh, on the <clears throat> scholarly work that has been published. So I think we gathered around 20 names that we thought were really extraordinary. We were very excited about it, and a number of names that we would add in a potential book later on. Yeah, the series was basic or. or Origi- originally conceived for 15, then mm. it grew to 20, then 25, yeah, yeah. and they all came to Stockholm and presented this. Unfortunately, COVID stopped us with the last few okay. talks we had, but we did them online later mm. on. So we, we so it, it, it was a decision made by me within the Center of Future Places and mm. also with our academic and strategic yeah. board. Yeah, and what, uh, let's say, when we open the book, what will we read about? What are the chapters and based on what? What are the topics? There, it's always this sort of arbitrary the, the, the distribution <laughs> of papers. And I know at the end, sometimes the authors are not always happy. Why am I in this chapter? And I'm, yeah. I'm just doing, for example, two uh, um, contributions uh, for Encyclopedia of Regional Science. And, and my my uh, topics were put in completely wrong sections. Mm, okay. So I had to tell the editors, you, you need to actually yeah, like- <laughs> put, put public open public spaces under cities, not under... Uh, economic governance or something. So I think at the end, you'll never be always 100% happy how it looks like. But we decided on topics on four four sections. Mm. And the first sections was uh, um, we had the politicized spaces and beyond. So it was a lot about to do about uh, politics of urban space, about equality, Mm. why public space matters, and about the just city. So those are those topics. Yeah were gathered under, I think, probably seven papers under that first. Mm. The second selection or second uh, section was about contemporary urbanism grounds. And that one had to do more with maybe urban planning and design concrete, looking at objects in spaces, Mm. how do we arrange things, and everything from walkability to streetscape. Mm. Uh, So let's say maybe a little bit more of the hardware of the city as opposed to the software. Uh, The third one was really about the software, and we called it the New Urban Social Geographies. Mm. And that had to do with um, memorials, the health issues in the city, um, uh, longevity, uh, uh, body conscious design, and so on, and a little bit of an environmental aspect. And mm-hmm. finally, we c- closed it with issues of dwellings and cultures. Okay. Uh, everything from culture of the city, or maybe on everyday urbanism, mm-hmm. uh, uh, temporary city up down to digitalization in society, or yeah, sort of yeah. this virtual city. Mm-hmm. So in that way, we kind of, try to cover as much as we could in those four yeah. sections. So if I understand correctly, also like the target group, the people who are going to read this book, like anyone basically working with city making from planners, designers. It's true. This reminds me when you apply for books, <laughs> apply for suggestions of getting books published, they always ask you about target groups. Yeah. We tend to write all kinds of target groups <laughs> just to get the book maybe published faster or accepted. Yeah. But uh, this one was, uh, and uh, I would s- take this as a, as a very uh, 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 just criticism. Mm. It's very academic in a way because all, okay. the, all the colleagues of mine, distinguished colleagues in this book, they're academics. Yes. Practitioners, of course, because a lot of their research was done on the ground with, with different social groups, mm. with different practi- mm. professionals and so on. Yeah. But nonetheless, 
it's an academic language yes um based on their research and uh, of course some practitioners would say well why didn't you make a book of practitioner females mm. because we're the doers and these <laughs> these women are just philosophizing yeah, yeah. which i would say i'm on the same line as my colleague neil brenner from graduate school of design at harvard he has uh, i think put a uh, together a very interesting urban theory lab maybe some 10 15 years ago he moved yeah. to chicago and came back yeah and he always posed and i think we should go back to these statements and i like it a lot we have in urban studies a, a sort of a field in the intellectual disarray. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, opposing and um, contesting concepts and categories and, and you know ideas going around, which is of course fruitful, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to get stable grounds for something mm -hmm. to be done on the ground. Okay, something yeah. to deliver yeah. to the practitioners. Yes. If yes. We, so creating new theories and new concepts, or Rem Koha said, if you cannot do that, at least try to get some new terminology in. Right. Yeah. I yeah. think that was that was that. So yeah. uh, it's it's for academics, but it's also for decision makers and practitioners at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, together with us today, we have also three of the contributors. That's right. Uh, should we connect and talk with them as well? Absolutely. Let's do it. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, three distinguished female scholars with us, part of the Women Reclaiming the City book and the Athena Scholar Scholars series. Uh, Professor Seta Lowe from the Graduate School of City University of New York is with us. Uh, Professor Karen Frank from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And last but not least, Professor Loretta Lees from Boston University here in Boston. Uh, and we'll be discussing the women reclaiming the city. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really happy to have you here. And uh, let's, let's uh, start with you, Setha. And uh, I read your, your chapter. It's amazing. And I, I love to ask you a few questions. Uh, what is the absolutely most important aspect in, in uh, public space? The most important aspect is that we don't appreciate it, that it encouraged flourishing at the individual neighborhood or community and city and even nation level, that if we invested in public space, um, we could make a difference all the way down from mental health to social justice. Um, and the other most important thing I think about public space is I think in terms of investment. I mean, we there are lots of things cities need. We need we need housing. We need a lot mm. of things. But public space because it impacts so many different things from you know the informal economy or sustainability, environmental sustainability to health and mental health to um, recreation, play, creativity, resilience. There are just so many things that public space can can change and that we have evidence that it in fact does change. That if we have very few dollars um, uh, or thinking globally in developing cities, that I think the, our first priority is to develop a network of public spaces mm -hmm. where people can be together, encounter one another, but also provide all these other benefits. Yeah. I just think it's a lot of... We say in English, a bang for your buck. That means you get a lot for investing in public space. Mm. Even if those public spaces are not all the same, even if they vary, that ultimately green space and blue space makes a huge difference. Yeah. And you mentioned in, in, your, in, your, in the chapter flourishing. What, what do you mean by flourishing? How do you define it? Well, flourishing is a, a positive psychology concept. Um, and I chose it because I felt it was a little bit more than what we usually as planners and desire, designers think of because flourishing isn't just doing well, it's thriving. Mm -hmm. It's um, being able to, in all dimensions of your life, really expand and grow from, again, again, this wide uh you know, thing all the way from the, your health and well-being mm. to having social relations, to um, being creative, to having occupational uh, availability, let's say. Yeah. So I chose flourishing on purpose. I, I'm, to be honest, not sure it's the best word. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, I, but I, what I was trying to do, we could say thrive or uh, grow, create, but 
and I'm particularly interested in social justice. So, you know, mm. but I was trying to think of something that would go across scales. Mm. In other words, individual flourishing all the way up to flourishing of a, of a city or a region that we were thinking of something that would scale up and down. Yeah. Yeah. And we recorded an episode, uh, I think one or two year, years ago. And now with, the, with your chapter in this book, you mentioned a lot of aspects uh, that public space should deliver to society, like a uh, place for play, festivals, a uh, uh, place for... Cultural uh, identity, Exactly. Yeah. But as an urban designer, what should I prioritize? There are a lot of things that I should put, but if I have to prioritize a few aspects, which are the, the ones? Well, here's what I... Here's the way I thought about the book, and I'm not sure exactly what people have read. Mm. But in the introduction, I posit a kind of model. It's yeah. a heuristic model. It's not a perfect model. But um, of why it is that public space works in the way it is. Mm. Not looking at the outcomes, not looking at the antecedents, but looking at public space as a kind of dare I say mediator and for those who are scientists in the audience don't I'm not I don't mean in a quantitative way but still that there are things that happen in public space that take a place a particular place with certain kinds of demography certain kind of history whatever and can produce the kinds of positive outcomes that the book is really looking at and negative outcomes yeah. it's not it's just that i don't focus on it and there's three components mm. to that model and one is very familiar to you as designers that you design for contact and that we know that contact really has these kind of liberalizing effects mm. that um, it's probably much more important to humans than we ever thought COVID being the example, but that you design a place where people will come in contact with one another. But what I argue in the book is contact without other elements doesn't necessarily make for a mm. successful or positive or flourishing public space. And that you also need to be thinking about public culture and thinking about how do you design for culture? Mm. Uh, well, one thing is to understand what culture yeah, is there yeah. in the first place and to look at places that do in fact produce. So it could mean in certain spaces that everybody needs a place to be together, but they also need their own individual places where they can feel identified or attached. Mm. In other words, that you as a designer, now I say planner or as yeah. thinking about the spaces. And then finally, I added one more element called affective atmosphere. Uh, means... Not a great term. You're going <laughs> to find me a better term. Term, one of you, please. Um, that's from the academic jargon. But what we're talking about is how a place feels. Mm. And here is where I really think design makes a huge difference. Now, events can make a difference. You know, I use the yeah. example of Yankee Stadium. Everybody wins. Mm. Everyone's talking to one another. They lose. They stay away. But I do think that designers can be thinking about how do we create a positive atmosphere or an atmosphere where, where connection mm. can occur. Yeah. But without public culture or something like it, mm. without this kind of affective atmosphere, which could be done with social, uh, social media, then the contact isn't going to turn into the mm. attributes. So that's where I think the designer should be thinking, not on the outcomes, but on the space itself and how it is that it transforms uh, into something that, that is flourishing. Exactly, with having people and the human in the center when they, when they design. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Seta. And before we, we, we move to the next guest, Tell me, like, uh, I know you're producing books and, and chapters and so on. What is the <laughs> latest book you're working on, apart from this one? Okay. Um, well, um, Mark McGuire, a colleague of mine, and I just turned in a book called to Stanford called Trapped, okay. T-R-A-P-P-E-D. Yeah. And it's on the rise of security capitalism and how mm. to escape it. And right now, in three days, or you know, I have to deliver a book called uh, beach politics, okay. which is on environmental social fragility, and it's uh, about how we save now our 
beaches, our shorelines yeah, um, yeah. from incursion. Interesting. So I wish you all the, the best luck in delivering and we're looking forward to read it as usual, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I had one short one, if it's okay. Yeah. Which I wanted to ask all three of our colleagues. Uh, when you look at public space and the future of public spaces within the feminist planning perspective, Seta, what would you say is the most pertinent thing that needs to be done when it comes to planners, designers, uh, and even academics? What do we need to turn to, to change? To change? Well, I mean, uh, Tigran, I'm still hearing, um, especially in Europe, where I've been spending a lot of time with my colleagues, mm. uh, that women don't feel safe in space. Yeah. And um, in some cases, children, certainly with a turn with guns in the United States mm. um, or the kinds of conflicts. I mean, one of the things about Gaza that I've writ written in the book on beach politics is the beach was a safe place for everyone. That was one of the places that women and children could go. Um, so, I mean, it's nothing new. You're asking me to look into the future. But I don't think I need to look into the future until we've really solved the kinds of um, gendered uh, or, uh, again, it, it, you know, uh, gay uh, uh, issues. Um, there are lots of people who aren't safe in space. You know, my young men of color in Central Park still don't feel safe. These are the kinds of issues we still have right. to look at and that I really haven't taken on. And I think others in our group today will talk mm. maybe more about that, who really right. know a lot more than I do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, we move on to, to Karin. And uh, your contribution to this book is more focused on, on uh, uh, like, Memorials and monuments, like more on the, on the objects in, in a public space or, or a square. Um, tell us why people like engage differently. Okay, I would like to emphasize it's not about objects. Hmm. It's about the space. Yes. Okay, and it happens that the space often has today in memorials hmm. uh, very interesting arrangements. Um, for example, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., which really, I would say, brought home the advantages of a more spatial memorial that people could walk through, and also that listed the names, the individual names um, of those who died. And I went there before it was even finished, and I was just taken aback by what I would say, what a memorial can be. Mm. And I was also taken aback by how people interacted with it, touched the names, left items there, often flags, but often um, clothing or other, I don't know what to say it, belongings from the person who died. Mm. And in fact, those have been collected and are in an archive that one can make an appointment to visit. That is just amazing to me, that attention. So then when the September 11 memorial was built, a similar design approach was taken with individual names. And of course there was a tremendous issue of which names and how they should be arranged next to each other in groups. It took a lot of careful mathematical mm. algorithmic work to group the names. And again, um, Items were collected, but now that museum is in great financial difficulty and it's closed. So this whole engagement with something so physical and so emotional really, really still moves me. Mm. Um, now, <laughs> there's always an issue, of, is, has it been designed right? Yeah. And for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, certainly veterans were involved in it. Um, but only male veterans, not surprisingly. So eventually another, in this case, statue had to be added. The other issue, of course, was that many veterans thought that this black wall was demeaning. So again, a statue had to be added. Um, so what also strikes me is that compared to other design projects in the world, like buildings, the general public is just much more involved 
this goes back even to the efforts to build a memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That took a tremendous number of years. I think it's 40 years. Um, and it turns out to be a memorial that you can walk through and touch. Mm. Um, I just, am, when I prepared for this session, I thought, I've done a whole book, right? <laughs> Memorials of Spaces of Engagement. Yeah. But I can't stop thinking about this, mm. particularly with your questions. Yeah. So if you can mention, like, some aspects that makes people in, engage and, 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 and love to be there, love to touch, to, to, to stay there? Well, I think I've talked about some of them, that they can reach the names. Well, for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, they can't reach all of them because it's very tall. Mm. But, but people do go up on top, which is kind of dangerous, and, and to try to reach down. I think you're prevented from doing that that you can come so close that in some cases the design it doesn't it wasn't on purpose i don't think but it <laughs> happens in uh, the september 11 memorial the way the names are engraved you can stick things into those names okay a flower maybe a, a small flag mm. and of course people leave things there too but that you can actually put yeah. things in there attach yeah you know i'm, I'm thinking now it's it's like a shrine. Mm. It's a modern version of a shrine. I've never thought of it that way before, but it, it really is quite amazing. And that, and that both people who were asked to participate in the development of the design, and then when it was publicized, people who were connected with it, who were outraged by certain things, mm. I mean, eventually, I think with the September 11 memorial, I think Mayor Bloomberg had to step in and make some decisions. This is just remarkable to me. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. And, and how... Um, another example yeah. Yeah. that I would uh, throw out there that's uh, is the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. Mm. And um, that project took a tremendously long time. And uh, Peter Eisenman stuck through the whole time, but... Richard Serra, a sculptor, was not used to that kind of process, and he 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 bowed out. Um, and in that place, people climb on those stella and jump and and do things that are really not safe. Mm. And they're very concerned there, since it's <laughs> the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, not for the guards to intervene too um, aggressively. So again, you have this uh, dilemma. Yeah. between people using the space mm -hmm. and then doing it in a way that's both dangerous and some people find sacrilegious. Yeah, yeah. But how can we find the common ground, let's say, between the users and the aim of, like, a designer design for a purpose? I don't, then... think, you, I, I don't think a common ground is a, is a goal. I think uh, as long as there's input... And as long from an organized group, yeah. and as long as there's chance for the public to respond before it's built, mm. or to respond enough after that it may be modified. For example, <laughs> the memorial to Princess Diana in the Hyde Park is uh, a fountain, a circular fountain, mm. well, uh, oval, and uh, people started walking in it, <laughs> and that was quite dangerous for mm. slipping. So, um, <laughs> Hyde Park uh, stepped in and changed that surface so it's not so slippery. Uh. I just find all of that negotiation and trying to find a solution. I mean, some memorials, some monuments are insulting to certain groups. Mm -hmm. That's true in Santa Fe. A monument was built to... Civil War soldiers, and it referred to savage natives, mm. and somebody excised that. That's the other thing. The public goes in and makes a change. Yeah, and then that uh, was toppled in 2020 on Indigenous Peoples Day. It was just mm -hmm. thrown over. Mm. Um, this is just amazing. This I don't know connection between the monument. And the people. Yeah, yeah. I, I love to take the chance to ask you because many people ask me to ask you this question and to raise up this this uh, topic. I'm from Baghdad 
And uh, many years ago, we had the uh, dictatorship, Saddam Hussein, and he had a lot of uh, st status, uh, study uh, of him in different cities and public squares and so on, and about wars that he, he did. And now, after afterwards, uh, some of them still there, of like um, picturing some of the wars or some of the things happening during his dictatorship. The new government wants to remove this. Some people wants them to stay to remind us. Some of them know it remind us of like a bad time. How can we think there? How can we what? Think. Should we keep? Should we remove? Should we change? I don't think we can make a should statement overall. Okay. Uh, I would say there's some very interesting examples. One is Memento Park in Budapest, where they have collected <laughs> statues built at Marx and Lenin. To me, that's just ingenious. ingenious. <laughs> um, but some people, and then for Robert E. Lee Memorial as a Confederate general in the South, that's been a big dilemma. And particularly during the Black Lives Matter, um, in um, in Richmond, Virginia, there's there was a pedestal, and members of the community went and wrote graffiti on that pedestal, mm. and then they hung the um, victims of police violence around the fence, and they also uh, established a little community garden in the lawn. Now, eventually, the whole thing was taken down. Yeah. And um, I don't know if the statue is in storage or not. Another possibility is to put the statue in a cemetery. Mm. And this is true of some Robert E. Lee monuments. And then there's a new book that really throws me called Smashing Statues, The Rise and Fall of American Public Monuments by Erin Thompson. Mm. And in there she talks about the value of destroying them completely and turning them to, to dust. Okay. I, 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 I don't go along with that. No. I mean, what are you saying? What are you saying? You're, weird you're killing the past? <laughs> mm, mm. So you are more into like keeping some things that remind us of the past. But commenting on it. Yeah. Not letting it just stand. Okay. Putting it in some kind of context. Mm -hmm. Now, when they put the Robert E. Lee statues in cemeteries, I'm not sure there's any plaque there. Um, the Santa Fe Monument, for a while, before it was toppled, had this historic, uh, how should I say, justification of the original statue. Yeah. Well, this is how we thought in those days. Uh, again, that's gone now. Yeah. Um, so that's the other interesting thing. I just thought of that. Mm -hmm. The life of a single monument over time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very interesting. And, and, uh, and uh, my, my question to you now about books. Uh, tell us more about uh, your recent book. Well, the recent book was, a, I would say, a work of love. This is the book. <laughs> It's called Routledge Handbook of Urban Public Space. Yeah, yeah. And many of the chapters are written by my former PhD students mm. based on their dissertations. Nice. And because they came from different countries, yeah. they drew their information from cases in different countries. I'm afraid none from Iraq, mm. but certainly uh, Turkey and China and Taiwan. Yeah and Brazil, I mean, a number of countries. Mm. And I was very keen, I'm always very keen on how we should organize books, particularly one so big. Mm. So it's organized into six, seven parts. Yeah. Emerging types of public spaces. I'm fascinated by the whole typing phenomenon. <laughs> Recreation, commerce, protest, living. Okay celebration and research methods and to put the section on living in public space in there that's living in santa cruz outdoors homeless what we call unhoused people living in the streets of kinshasa yeah and also in paulo brazil mm. i mean i just beautiful 
and I did this with a former PhD student of mine, Tae Sheng Huang. I couldn't have done it without him. The, the bureau, the details, uh, oh, just beyond <laughs> my pay grade. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Karin, and and we move to to Loretta. I would like to make one correction. Please, I'm I'm retired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Loretta, um, I read your chapter, and uh, it's. Uh, I love that you also explain to us uh, more because for me it was like there's a, a huge challenge when it comes to to comparative urbanism. So let's start firstly, so you can tell our listener what does it mean. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting following off the back of Karen talking about the value of different students from different parts of the world mm. talking about urban public space. You know, I mean, comparison has always and long been at the centre of urban studies. You know, we're almost obsessed in kind of looking for similarities and differences between cities, you know, and that's quite normal. You know, we're kind of, you know, these kind of binaries are kind of embedded in the way that we kind of socially construct language and thought and other things. Um, so if you go back to kind of some of the key figures in kind of what we might now call classic comparative urbanism, yeah. you know, we can think about sociologists like, I guess, Charles Tilley, uh, Janet Abu Loghard, uh, 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 Charles Pick Vance. And their work, you know, kind of looked at some of the kind of methodological intricacies of trying to do a mm -hmm. good comparative analysis, what it might look like, what it might be. They were also interested in the kind of issue of generalizing across different case based comparisons from around the world. And also, I think they were really interested in the kind of value of doing in-depth kind of comparative research and historically positioning or contextualizing um, comparative case studies. But the work that I'm interested in at the moment is called the new comparative urbanism. Mm. So it's it kind of setting itself slightly aside from that classic urbanism work, comparative urbanism work. Mm. And that's really what I'm writing about in the chapter in Tigran's book. And this is a new body of work in comparative urbanism that's trying to create a truly cosmopolitan global, global urban studies. Mm -hmm. It's trying to uh, decolonize global urban theory by decentering global urban theory from the north in particular, but also the focus on cities in the global north. You know, mm -hmm. for a long time, it was London and New York that was dominating mm -hmm. Chicago School mm -hmm. of Sociology. Then we went to the L.A. school trying to decenter all of these kind of, you know, Euro-American global north cities. And this work was really exciting for me. So it kind of emerged in the early 2000s and it's really grown in significance, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become really influential, particularly on how new, newly minted urbanists around the world are doing urban research and thinking about cities globally. And of course, there's been a big push now to really take seriously the mm -hmm. urban in the global south and the global east, which makes a lot of sense when you think of some of the mega urbanizations yeah. and the processes that are happening there completely, mm -hmm. you know, kind of outfly anything that's happening in Boston outside my window here, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so what it does is it acknowledges, I guess, the diversity of urban experiences. So it's also really interested in kind of grassroots grounded urban experiences mm -hmm. from cities all over the world. And the one thing I really like is it kind of puts all cities on this kind of level playing field. So, you know, like uh, New York doesn't, you know, kind of take over Portland in Maine or whatever. Mm. Big cities don't overtake small cities. They're not important. Um, so some people talk about it as a kind of provincialism or kind of looking at provincial cities as opposed to global cities. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, cities in the global north as opposed to, you, you know, and kind of thinking through the global south. Yeah. Um, so I think the kind of critical bit of it, which lots of new kind of PhD students and postdocs of mine are really excited by, is how it writes against mm. that Euro-American mainstream. And that is not easy. You know, we're so indoctrinated mm. and saturated mm. by, you know, Euro-American theory that it's really difficult to think outside that box mm. and think outside that focus on that very limited kind of number of American and European cities, particularly in how we do theory. Um, you know, so quite simply, every every city has the potential to make theory. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I'm also wondering, like, how can can comparative urbanism help cities? Yeah, I mean, 
that's an impo- a really important question because it's not just about helping academics in their careers and <laughs> decolonizing global urban studies. Actually, perhaps much more important is how do we help cities with this? Yeah. Well, I think one thing it's it's done for me that's really important is it's began to peel away some of these big conceptual labels like global city. And if you think about it, you know, cities all around the world are all aspiring to be global, whether it's Lagos in Nigeria or, you know, Shanghai in China. Mm. You know, they all want to be global in that very kind of, you know, kind of New York, London kind of way. And it's getting even policymakers and practitioners on the ground to start to rethink Mm. how we think about cities globally. You know, not just kind of comparing yourself to paradigmatic cities, but actually doing things differently, potentially. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, if you read deep into the kind of new comparative urbanism, it really gets you to think about who's talking for cities. And it kind of radically, I think, redistributes how we talk about cities. It's not just about you know, kind of high flying academics. Mm. It's not about the Saskia assassins of this world anymore. It's about people on the street. It's about policymakers, practitioners. It's about kind of looking outside the kind of norms of what we do when we look at urban theory. Mm. And I think that's really important for cities everywhere. Yeah. And and, and Loretta, you mentioned it's 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 slow, the comparative urbanism. So how yeah. or what is the idea to speed it up? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So it was slow when I wrote that chapter. <laughs> it is beginning to speed up a little bit, okay. but I still think we've got an awful long way to go. Mm. And partly it's because it's very difficult to kind of break out of that kind of way of doing things. Mm. So, for example, this just this past week, I've got a paper coming out in Dialogues in Urban Research that talks about what I think engaged dialogue should be in urban studies. And mm. um, what I talk about is the fact that actually we shouldn't all be talking like we are in this this kind of podcast today amongst ourselves as kind of you know mm-hmm. intelligentsia kind of you know global urban studies scholars but actually we should be talking on the ground we should be taking conversations relationships with people on the ground both the general public mm. community organizations and groups and we should have them in this room we should have them in this academic space but not just have them in as these kind of tokens but actually as mutually significant people who've yeah. got just as much to say just as much intelligence mm. on cities as we have and we're not quite there yet in academia no. and urban studies you know we're still publishing as academics we rarely publish with non-academics mm. and this is something i've started so a couple of years ago i decided to publish with um a woman that I'd been working with in London who was being displaced from a public housing project that was being demolished and I'd been fighting with her in public inquiries. Mm. And I thought to myself, why am I utilising her knowledge of her displacement for my own value in my own career in this academic context? And then I thought, well, actually, I would like to publish with her and do a joint piece of work with her. But very few journals are interested in publishing that. And eventually I kind of talked to the editors at City Mm. and they were like, yeah, we've never thought about this, but that's a really neat idea. And so I think I've begun to try to trigger debates about what we do as academics in urban studies. Mm. What what do you think, Tigran? I I actually thought about the same thing, but then you probably have to set up your own journal Mm. in order to do this. They're still very conservative about this. Yeah. I can't believe how how difficult and excuse me, tight as they are. Yeah, I agree. And you sometimes get a review from somebody who doesn't seem to have really read your your article. Mm. I, I just, I'm astounded by that. Mm. So, uh, there's so a so certain so. high-handedness that they're in charge. Those reviewers are the keepers of quality. I uh, just won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Setha, you want to say something? Anthropology has yes. been... And there has has looked at the urbanism at, from an, a world p- global perspective always, and a lot of the anthropology journals also are very comfortable with um, these kinds of articles and have a long, long tradition of writing with or highlighting the voices of those whom we work with. And so, I would suggest anthropology journals and. I personally feel that urban studies, for whatever reason, has ignored a lot of the anthropology that has written about comparative cities and 
had organized a conference about it and it didn't work out. But mm. to say that anthropology seems not to be a voice in urban studies and yet that's where you would find a lot of your materials and your journals that have a long tradition um, that would probably fit what you're trying to do. And that's an interesting disciplinary problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to just kind of go back on that. So a lot of the work I've drawn on is from anthropology. So Michael Hertzfeldt's work, for example, right. where you do that, you know, you kind of join up with people on the ground and you write together and you do ethnographic research together. So, yeah, but, but anthropology, you know, in this supposedly transdisciplinary urban studies, mm. certain uh, disciplines still dominate. Geography, urban planning, sociology still dominate. Mm -hmm. And it's an issue. Yes. So, and with that, also, we say thank you so much, uh, Loretta and Karin, for being with us. Uh, and thanks a lot for, for contributing with your knowledge. And, and for uh, being part of the book, right? Yeah, the yeah. Athena series. Mm -hmm. um, I feel well, this very has been fortunate. A great honor. Yeah. This has been a great honor. I think the whole idea of the Athena series was remarkable. I really do, Tigran. It's just remarkable. And that we got to go there, really. Thank and you. we're so well Hosted, I mean, unbelievably. Unfortunately, well COVID came in, and uh, there was a few speakers left, like as Loretta and a few others that were not yeah. able to come anymore. But oh, we, I didn't realize we rectified that, that in just, the book. Unfortunately, that it was, was just difficult. An incredible. Mm. I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, it thank was you. an incredible <laughs> kind of recognition. Really Thank was. you so much. Very just, kind. Yeah, I, I'm glad I was. For, for me, it, yeah. for me as a kind of younger scholar still, I think for for me it was an incredible privilege to be part of this with Karen and Seth and everybody else in the book as well. I think it's a really really good idea. Yeah. Thank you so much. One, I can just add that we're going to prepare a special version of this book for for um, expanded for students only. Mm. So students will get yeah. a free copy of this book. It will be uh, because I have the copyrights and I, of course, ask each and every author to say yes uh, so we can give them for free because the book is pretty expensive for plain students yeah. Uh, yeah. or graduate or undergrad. That, that is the problem. I'm yes. very lucky with my new book on public space. It's unbelievably expensive, but there mm. is an e-version right. that's much better looking right. with colored images <laughs> that I... I forget how much it is, but fortunately there is such a thing now. But uh, I think that they will receive this for free. I can guarantee you this. So they will all yeah. enjoy your yeah. wonderful chapters yeah. in there. So thank you again. And hopefully uh, we're going to have more conversations like this for sure. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to say something that you probably can recognize. Mashallah. Ah, ah. Shukran. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank, thank care. you so much. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. So what do you think about the conversation we had? That was wonderful. I, yeah. I, have, I have this privilege to know all of them. And um, somebody always said to me, it's like, is there anybody that you don't know? <laughs> no, there, there's quite a few people. But yeah. uh, I, I had the privilege to live in this generation to meet, yeah. Yeah. to sort of meet all of these people. Mm -hmm. And then some, somebody said to me, you're like the Bob Geldof urbanism. And I thought, <laughs> okay, what does that mean? That means, oh, you can put a live eight together, but your singles or your music is really bad. <laughs> in a sense, your scholarship is not that great, which I kind of like. You know, I think it was, uh, I, I hate Mondays or something. It was only one hit single by, yeah, yeah. by, by his group. <laughs> Yeah. But he's put this together. And I like to put this, assemble people, mm, yeah. especially this wonderful group. And we had the privilege to listen to Karen Frank and Seth mm. Alov and Loretta Lees, my good colleagues and friends. And I think wonderful three perspectives we yeah, heard. Yeah, of course, like different <clears throat> scales, different Great, perspectives. Great, yes. Yeah. And the scholarship that they produce all the time and also these always renewing new, uh, I would say, new <clears throat> challenges that they come up with or actually raise yeah. very important research questions yeah. for all of us. Yeah, and let's let's get back to you, the editor of this book. Tell me, what are the challenges you face when you edit a great book like this? I'm trying to remember this might be my um, sixth anthology. Okay. Uh, before I had the, the series of, on urbanisms and beyond, one is still left to be done, and yeah. there was the emergent urbanism and a number of other ones. Um, I would say you, always the first one is always the most difficult one. Okay. The other ones, you know, you tend to think they're going to be easier. The challenges, as my colleague Emily Talen said, how do you put all these cats in one bag? <laughs> so they can be female or male cats or yeah, yeah. in between yeah. or different uh, transgender cats. But um, it's uh, 
in a sense, it's actually very easy to do, mm -hmm. but it's also very complex in, in, in a way that it should make a logical sense. The, the, the chapters should flow into each other. Sections should be connected. Yeah. There should be a message coming out of an anthology. Mm -hmm. um, number of academics, including my late father, were skeptical about anthologies in a way, okay, how much weight do they carry in comparison to, to your own book or to a book uh, on the subject? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you put them in, a, in the right way, and I think they do, mm. sp they really do carry a lot of weight. And of course, it's, you know, it's like uh, opening a book of stories. You can pick and choose and you can yeah. find the chapters and the themes and topics that, that are interesting for you. Yeah. Um, of course, there's always difficulties. People might drop out from the books. They might have ah. opponents and enemies. And okay. uh, they see enemies within, you know, in academia is sometimes a dirty, dirty place. Okay. <laughs> it's ah. not always nice. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of very difficult personalities and clashes of ideologies. It's like people, they want, they don't want to be on the same book with the other. Sometimes, but I, I, what I've always tried to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a little bit critical and negative about when you see anthologies that have the same feel and same ideological mm -hmm. stance and same sort of uh, atmosphere about it, then yes, it's fine. But then you don't have this sort of no. opposing clashes of views, which is very fruitful. Yeah, yeah. So I think from beyond the urban urbanism, I think all the books have been very different. And at some, we, I've had fortune to work with two of my colleagues, Chris Olson and of course, Hans Wessel, we put a really nice... Uh, post-urban world anthology for uh, Rutledge, yeah. which won the I think Regional Science Award mm -hmm. a couple of years back. Yeah, so it's it's difficult, but I um, I kind of enjoy it. And 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 in this book, there are like many the co-authors or the contributors. How is the communication with them? How do you keep track? Okay, what is the status of each one of them? Is their text is done? Need to... sure. Uh, I think one of the uh, things that made the the work sort of uh, transit m more easier to work. The whole book was that it, that it was the result of the Athena series, lecture series. Ah. So we already had a prepared ground where everybody gave a talk and there yeah. was a paper prepared. Although this paper changed dramatically until they came into the book. Ah. When you get them, then they yeah, start yeah, editing yeah, and yeah. they come up with new ideas. And I think uh, in mm. case of Seta, there was a whole new paper coming out in a number of... <laughs> Other colleagues, which was fine, yeah, uh, the, because the initial idea was to do the transcripts, yes, but uh, we didn't really opt for that. Mm -hmm. so some basically have done that, uh, and then the contact you have to have one on one contact with each other, and then sometimes yeah. with, with the group, yeah. And also, I had my colleague uh, <coughs> who was working in the center, she was a research assistant, Morgan Schwab, who was helping mm -hmm. in the first initial stages to with the you know extra context and getting getting the the editing uh, articles in and we also have an editor yeah. and of course he passed the language editing at the end and then finally Roman and Littlefield as the publisher that came in on board it's it's an interesting story about um, it mm -hmm. was actually given the, there were three other publishers fighting for this book oh that's good uh, it's good I shouldn't put any names up yeah and there was one before Roman and Littlefield that was supposed to publish this okay uh -huh. but uh, at the end I think we passed it had very, really excellent three peer reviews. Yeah, but uh, the the publisher had some uh, reservations or somebody at the board for specific things they wanted to start changing things. And I was pretty adamant I'm not going to change this extraordinary group in any way. If mm. it's past the peer reviews, everybody's happy about it. Yeah, and then of course Roman and <clears throat> Littlefield, sorry, uh, jumped in, and it was it was a wonderful uh, publishing company, but it was also a nightmare to work with them. Because of, <laughs> because in the editing process, a small communication, uh, also the last version, there were some things missing. We rectified small things uh, in the ebook. Um, my intro, yeah. half of it is gone. That's why my introduction is okay. short. <laughs> I'm very open about these things. This is what happens at times. But yeah. it's it's okay. At the end, the final product is really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a very expensive book, which it shouldn't. If, mm. if I was being asked, I would give all academic books for free. Yeah. How, um, where, where can we find this book and buy it? It's, of course, everywhere in any pub, uh, online publishing outlet yeah. uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, all the Amazons. Yeah. Of course, in Sweden, it's Ad Libris and Bocus, and then you'll find them in uh, all the UK, you know, Australian, uh, and American uh, online bookshops. And, of course, one can 
also uh, directly order from Roman and Littlefield. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's a code we can actually give that yeah, at we can the put end it of in the there. show yeah. uh, where you can get 30% of uh, rebate for that book. Nice, nice. So, um, like a lot of books that are being produced uh, from, let's, uh, let's say, academia and people in academia, we as a practitioner is not really like reading or, or are in touch with these books. So how can we read and implement w- the knowledge that in these books? That's a that's a brilliant question. It's one that has been plague plaguing us or all us academics in a way. <laughs> Firstly, how relevant is my work within the academic society? How relevant is for decision makers and practitioners? Mm. Is the language user friendly? Is it too complicated or not? Uh, I remember reading some planning theory books and I was a postgraduate student. And some of them were almost impossible to understand. Okay. You had to reread them twice. <laughs> Even, let's say, let's reading Bill Hillier's Social Logic of Urban Space or uh, the Space is the Machine, you feel like you need to have a PhD in mathematics to understand <laughs> it. But uh, I think you're right. Sometimes I remember in research when people do PhDs, they do a popular version for practitioners or professionals, uh, which okay. at times, yeah. and I think if some of our my PhD students have done it, which I think it's a great idea. Yeah. That's very difficult to do in this. Uh, in when you do academic book, either you do it for your, you know, partially for your career, yeah. for your students, for the academic uh, uh, assemblage or your colleagues. Mm. So, um, how do you make these books relevant? You find probably more relevant that I've seen this in the last ten years. I'm not going to name give names. That would mean I would uh, probably give them uh, <laughs> uh, not the advocate, but. Uh, boost up their sales. But I can take two. One example, it's The Soft City by uh, D- David. David Sim. Yeah, yeah. That is a brilliant example mm-hmm. of, I would say, a practitioner, yeah. but based in Inst- Gell Institute for Research, yeah. how a book can be not just translated into so many languages, mm-hmm. but extremely pertinent and uh, practical for, yes. for people on yes. the ground, from activists to city makers yeah. or city city advocates. So I think that that's a great example. Um, then, of course, you will have books that, let's say, Richard Florida or mm. Ed Glazer have done about cities, yeah. which become extremely popular because they're written in a sort of a bestseller type of form. Uh, and the language is understandable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, And then I, I would say people wrongly sometimes say, well, they're not academics. So I say, wait a minute, you didn't, didn't say their body of knowledge. Mm. They produce hundreds of papers and yeah, you yeah, know, investigations yeah. were amazing. Yeah. Uh, but then they also produced a key book mm. that is basically geared for general audiences. Yeah, yeah. So I would say if you have a message and if you have a, it's a strong one, you should maybe make it that way in a way. Make it a sort of like a bestseller book that you know that a mayor would read. Or I think it was uh, Enrique Penalosa's brother, Gil Penalosa, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. He made a book about cities, which was maybe 110 pages wow. with a lot of good pictures and yeah, text, yeah. which was simple but really good text. Mm-hmm. So I think one has to simplify the text at times. Yes. Uh, because my, my next question is actually about a lot of my colleagues uh, and listeners, uh, we have ideas that we might want to put, put them in the books and so on, but we are not like we are afraid of, of getting into this world of uh, writing a book and getting a publisher and sure. so on. It's like a, a headache. So what is your advice to us in case we have an idea or we have a topic to, to that we can t- write about? I think if it's if you have an accumulated body of knowledge, practice-wise, and, and also some interesting theoretical mm-hmm. developments, uh, and you are situated in an organization that can carry, in a sense, mm-hmm. let's say Alexander Stoller had made a really yeah. interesting book mm-hmm. based in Spacecape. Mm-hmm. We talked about David Sim being in 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 Gell. Yeah. Um, but also you can be independent, not being in that. And then yeah. if you feel there is something missing, I think. You can also join forces with an academic from within the field, okay. and maybe as a practitioner. We we see rarely those combinations mm. of academics doing with practitioners or academics yeah. doing with advocates, mm. or let's say civil society people that are like let's say you do a book on how social housing, and you're academic with somebody who is um, in charge of a neighborhood group for yeah. maybe twenty years of incredible experience mm. on the ground, because ah difficult how do i get it you're gonna get it easily more easily published than a scientific paper because the journals are so yeah. rigid and conservative mm. so they'll ask okay where is this second person based in a neighborhood group well that doesn't matter that doesn't yeah. work <laughs> yeah. recently we had a i did a paper with somebody who was 
just in between different academic places. Yes. And they said, well, you know, give us the, the university where he is. <laughs> so he had to pull out an old university and just oh, ask for some affiliation sad. for a short yeah, while yeah. to get it published. Yeah. So I, I would say never yeah. give up on that. It's mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> There is always a place for that. And I think those books are, honestly, I don't know, some of my academic colleagues would now be angry. They're much more popular than what we do in academia. Mm. They are, really. I mean, again, coming back to South yeah, City, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so many, if it's, that means the cities are interested. At the end of the day, it's going to be about work in the cities. Exactly. Like That's make, making the change. Absolutely. Because what should I do? Like, uh, if I have 1,000, book of 1,000 pages, but I cannot do, implement any of these pages in my. Yeah, so for sure. Like, uh, for sure kind of useless. And I think that's that's one of the things that it's important. And that was interesting with the new urbanism movement because it came both from academic and practitioner and, yeah, side. Yeah. So they, a lot of those practitioners brought in the, the, their ideas from their design projects, from yeah. whole civic town developments and neighborhoods uh, retrofitting and all that. And that started to sort of make uh, real waves in the theory development yeah. and, and uh, in, in, in developing new concepts and also influencing methodology, which was amazing. As well, yeah. And of course, with a lot of criticism to all of that, but nonetheless. Mm. Uh, so it should be kind of both ways. Exactly. Mm. Because this is, I, I think this is the reality also. Like reality is not only academia or practitioners. Like no, it's, no, it's no. a mix. No, absolutely. I, I, don't, I think I would have loved to see in a book by Jan Gehl and Bjarke Engels. <laughs> that would have been an amazing book. <laughs> Never happened. No, but Bjarke but said exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. he wrote uh, something in one of his books. I love you, Bjo uh, <laughs> Jan. Um, uh, Jan. I learned everything <laughs> about public space from you. <laughs> and we know that Bjarke is in a sort of extraordinary post-urbanist yeah, architect. Yeah. But with with a very, I would say, uh, fine-tuned understanding of mm -hmm. cities and sustainability and public spaces and so on. Yeah. So I think those those mergers would be really really right. nice. Right. Right. Unless you have a person like Rem Kulhas, who's basically done both, who is an urban mm -hmm. theorist but also has his practice. Yes. I like I like his urban theory part, but not his practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your um, like a takeaway message to us who is going to read your book? I think the pre predominantly the book is really based in a way that you know the principles of uh, feminist city planning should really start to matter in academia, and yeah. we should start to sort of understand the structural inequality mm. in academia and also inequality in cities in looking at how planning should be done. And it's not a breaking this patriarchal system that we have a different lens of female scholars and female practitioners. So it's really geared towards students and academia, and at the end. Some of these chapters, again, they're mostly academic. Mm. Maybe a follow-up would be something combining yeah. practice and academia, getting getting a follow-up book of, of different cases. Although I think a lot of our colleagues in the book take up cases mm. that they have researched and looked at. Yeah. And uh, do you have a code or discount code for our listeners? Oh, absolutely. You There's can, a uh, discount. Yeah, it. I'm not getting any royalties on, so it's, 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 it's good. <laughs> Uh, the discount code would be R L F A N D F thirty. Mm. So Richard Love uh, Fandango America Norway David Fandango thirty, <laughs> and you get an off. Uh, you get a discount of thirty percent. Yes, yes. And I think that's also valid for the ebook. Mm -hmm. uh, so ebook would probably be more acceptable yeah. in terms of price, price, but yeah. I I know some people like to uh, yeah, you know hold in their hand the yeah. physical. But I think we will have a follow up. Or we will have a <clears throat> next year. I would try to do a book um, extended version of this one. Yeah. Because there's three or four colleagues that wouldn't were not able to make the book. Dolores okay, uh, Hayden yeah. and um, mm. Anastasia Lucatis, and uh, we had uh, um, I would say uh, Chantal Muff and and uh, Patsy Healy and so on. That will complete this book really nicely, and then we will distribute it and give it for free to students. That's great. Which I think would be very nicely done yeah, uh, yeah. within our own publishing house, and I, I have all the rights to do it. So it's, awesome. it feels good. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Thank you for Friedman. having it's me. I think this is maybe the third great. time. Yeah. Great. And I hope last time I think I was like on speed, so I don't know if people <laughs> understood what I was saying. <laughs> Now I think it's a little bit slower, yeah, yeah, slower, yeah. but you can always slow me like you when slow <laughs> records. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's really wonderful. And thank you for giving us the opportunity and uh, um, the home to host this little book release really on women reclaiming the city. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we were not able to yeah, do it. And yeah. as it's such a big international 
assemblage of mostly women from Australia, UK, mm -hmm. and the US, it's hard to sort of, yeah. you know, where do, where do you do the book release? Yeah. And I think it's in virtual space, it's best. And of course, you're going to do it in the best podcast in Europe. And that's where Urbanistica. Thank you. Thank you so much. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Same. Thank you so much for having me.